All right, excellent. So we have started, and I'm going to begin by asking you the most important question. How many Star Trek collectibles do you have? Well, it depends how you count them, you know, because if, if I've got like 30 pages of concept art, is that like 30 or one? I would say like discrete items that we've bought in an auction, probably 25. The largest is a full-sized Borg mannequin that's, that uh, lives by my office at Google from the, uh, the movie First Contact. Um, and then we've got some like clothes that we've actually worn, a dress that Captain Janeway wore that, that my wife Britt wore on the Star Trek cruise. And then I wore a shirt that Jake Sisko wore in a bunch of episodes. So it's always really fun to be watching and be like, we have that dress. <laughs> It's one hell of a Halloween costume. How did you and your wife discover that you had this shared nerd mm. for, for, for Star Trek? I think we'd each watched a little bit of it before and had like had liked it but not gotten really into it. And, you know, looking for something to do in the evenings together to unwind, we started watching it and both just, just loved it. When I say loved it, loved the middle three, the next generation, Deep Space Nine and Voyager. Like the original series is a bit cheesy and Enterprise is kind of hit and miss. Right, right. The, you know, the, the Vulcan uh, motto or Vulcan salute is, you know, live long and prosper. Do you see that as reflecting in your philosophy as well? Definitely. I, I think there's a lot of really interesting things about Vulcans, how they have these powerful emotions, but they work to, to like mask them and do the right thing anyway. I like them. In about every single episode about a Vulcan, they have to learn how to use their emotions. There's a <laughs> Just like us. Yeah. I don't know about you all, but I had to do the same thing. <laughs> So then maybe, so maybe we should talk a little bit about the beginning. Um, I know that um, people often talk you about or ask questions about, you know, your, your family history. You have a very um, scholarly background. Your grandfather is one of the founders of Chicago Economics, Milton Friedman, and your father is David Friedman, one of the founders of anarcho-capitalism. How do you think that influenced your intellectual appetites? Hmm. I'd say I was definitely always uh, very interested in economics and politics and, and how things worked. Um, I think, you know, I think it definitely, it made me want to find big ideas. You know, I had this kind of feeling, I'm not sure this is a good thing, um, but that like studying something little or trying to solve a little problem was just, was just kind of pointless. Um, and that definitely drew me to when I graduated college and was thinking about like, where did I want to live? Like, uh, I'm feeling just like not excited to live in the U.S. and then going and studying other countries and feeling not excited to live in any of them. And, and you know, I think partly the family history is what, is what kind of gave me the, either the, the guts or the stupidity, depending how you look at it, to be like, well, all right, is there a way of solving this in a big way for everyone, like by starting new countries? Um, and, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, from my dad, the idea of designing new political systems, uh, designing new legal systems, um, analyzing them with law and econ, things like that. A lot of that systemic thinking. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's something that other commentators have noticed that Milton Friedman, he talks about specific policies, things that can be tinkered around the edges. Your father's more about systemic change. Where does your line of thinking fit in that progression? It's It's basically like the way I see it is kind of each method failing and then revising. So, you know, with my grandfather was like, let's propose economically efficient policies that meet people's stated goals. Let's try to persuade people with good arguments um, as to why they should favor freedom and good policies that lead to human flourishing. And, you know, on the one hand, some remarkable percentage of his ideas that were considered crazy at the time have now been adopted. You know, and that's amazing. The the all volunteer army, um, for example, um, you know, the earned income tax credit is is almost a negative income tax. Uh, but yet, the overall trend, you know, is is bigger government and more regulation and things failing. And I don't think that's because like there just weren't enough people like him. I think that ultimately these systemic factors overwhelm any one individual uh, argument. Um, or set of policies. And, and, I, and I think, you know, over the, 
the second half of the 20th century, we actually got a lot of economic theory about that, the whole public choice school. Um, and so then, you know, my dad comes along and, and instead of uh, advocating one rule change, uh, advocates for an entire new system called anarcho-capitalism, um, you know, which I think he kind of started out with uh, taking the, the ethical arguments as far as they could and saying, what if everything was consensual, but it, it turns out that there's actually really strong law and econ arguments that it might, anarcho-capitalism might produce laws that maximize net benefit. Um, and that's really neat. Uh, and he explored that and advocated for it, you know, and then I come along the next generation later and it's like, well, okay, there's, there's, you know, tens of thousands of people, thanks to the internet, maybe hundreds of thousands now who would love to try this system. Um, but, but they can't, you know, why is that? Clearly it's not that we're lacking ideas for, for new systems to try. Um, well, you know, I, I look around, well, it's because it doesn't matter if you have a new political system. It doesn't matter if 100,000 people are into it, unless you're willing to have a freaking revolution, um, you're not going to get to do it. And uh, I think most good people nowadays are not going to be involved in revolution. And so it's going to kind of select for the wrong place and the wrong people and the wrong start. Um, and so I, you know, my view is like, the problem is that we're not able to try new forms of government, that we don't have a startup sector for governance. Um, you know, and it's not that I like looked at the same situation and body of work as my grandfather and figured that out. It was more that there had been this accumulation of, of, of economic discoveries and of trying these strategies and, and having them not work. Was, uh, do you consider it a point of rebellion that you did not get into academia, but you, you decided to not argue, but build the future instead? Mm -hmm. no, not really. I mean, I, I find arguing and thinking in academia and, and writing very, very compelling and enjoyable. Um, I think it was more a feeling that, that again, like from experience, if, if that was what worked, if that was the best way to change the world, I probably would have happily done it. Um, you know, but yeah, I, I love speaking. I love writing, but I, I kind of had that Silicon Valley ethos and seeing that, you know, just having the ideas was demonstrably not enough. Um, you know, you got to put them into practice. Was there a, a, a single moment or a couple of very strong moments where this idea sort of catalyzed in your mind or was it just a long progression you just accumulated eventually that, okay, we, we got to do it this way? There's been some of each. Um, I think like going to my first Burning Man made me think like, wow, people are willing to put all of this energy and money and time into building an alternate society from scratch. Like maybe, you know, and its basis is more about art and, you know, an escape from the commercial world. Um, but it made me think, you know, maybe if you, if you created a new way of living, a new country, you could get people to put the same kind of energy in. And like it, to me, that's enough, like that amount of time and money and effort that people put into Burning Man, that's, that, that might be enough um, to get a new country started. So that was one moment. Um, I think getting the funding from Peter Thiel was another. Uh, before that, I'd written a whole online book about seasteading and, and given some talks, um, but that kind of kind of made it real. Um, but there's also been been just a lot of evolution through through discussion. So what was what was uh, tell me about the moment that you that you founded the seasteading institute? Obviously, it really took off with Peter Thiel. But what's the chronology here? Sure, I had um, the first thing I did was I. When I came back from Burning Man in maybe 99 or 2000, uh, I wrote some stuff up about the idea of doing ephemeral, uh, of doing a floating festival where we tried new rule systems for a week, um, you know, maybe in international waters, and kind of proved them with these short-term tests. Uh, and then a couple of years later, I found this paper by Wayne Gramlich, a retired sun engineer, um, called Seasteading. And his idea was to, his was basically the extreme of practicality. He wanted to take like two liter bottles and like garbage bags and kind of do the cheapest possible space. And he um, had looked into kind of the basics of, of power and, and food and stuff. Uh, he wasn't thinking about the political angle as much, um, but that was what made me think like, wow, like maybe, maybe we could actually do this. Turns out, you know, that 
in calm waters, there, there are easy, cheap ways of doing it. And uh, in rough waters, that stuff would just get smashed and that you really need more like oil platforms. But it still, it inspired me. And Wayne and I wrote a book together. Um, I actually, I wrote, this was uh, back before there was blogs and stuff. So I wrote a commenting system to let people click on any paragraph and add comments. Um, and so I was able to get reader feedback for, for a few years before. Uh, spam became a thing um, and I gave a couple of gave a couple of talks um, and was kind of blogging about it and then uh, some people who worked for Peter Thiel who read my blog uh, put me in touch with him set up a dinner uh, we talked about it and uh, he said hey how about I I fund you to lead Google and go work on this so we did and uh, at first I was kind of working on both. And then I was like, you know, this, these dating stuff is too exciting. I can't, I can't stay at Google. And, and it's very interesting that, well, well, two points. One is that you started with seasteading, not purely from the theoretical and political angle, but you, you began with the party, that concept of ephemeral. Ephemeral, I didn't know this. Ephemeral came before the seasteading institute. I thought that was something that was put on as a consequence of the seasteading institute. So it's interesting how art like uh, can can lead to a movement before the theoretical or practical underpinnings are there. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, we we didn't we weren't able to to do an ephemeral until the CSA Institute existed, and and in practice, it's become something somewhat different. Um, there's definitely you get the culture and different rules in the different islands, but we're still kind of within the U.S. legal system. Uh, it's definitely something that I hope to still hope to do someday is to do declare an offshore ephemeral, uh, maybe in the Caribbean or Mediterranean, uh, someplace where there's lots of countries and lots of vessels and uh, drop anchor at a, at a seamount in international waters and, and have a real, uh, a real yeah. ephemeral, but the day has not yet come. Let's hope the Haitian police don't uh, put an end to it like they did with uh, Operation Atlantis. <laughs> um, another point I wanted to mention is it's interesting that there's a lot, a very similar strategy a lot of people in the space have employed, that they, they, they start a blog, they, they become a thought leader, they start talking about it, and then they get to the point where they move from thought leadership into action. But the skills that are used for creating a blog and for thinking and communicating about ideas are not the same as getting an MLU or the process of creating a startup society. What type of changes in your behavior and uh, in, in your, your work did you have to do the transition to that? And what were some of the problems that you came across when doing that? Yeah, I mean, it's been, um, it's kind of been a continual process of, you know, especially because it took us, you know, I guess, I guess with uh, Honduras, I guess I had an MOU, um, you know, three or four years after I started the Sea Study Institutes. Um, but when I think, when I think about it, I really think about, you know, the last 15 years and kind of going back and forth between the, you know, the speaking and the writing and, and the building and how that's been like a continual process of learning. Like we've learned things from, from what we tried to do in the early days of the Sea Sending Institute. I learned things from Honduras. I learned things from what's happened late with, lately with, uh, with Blue Frontiers and French Polynesia. Um, and it is, to me, one of the hardest things is how much easier it is to speak than to do and how no matter how much you 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 know we really want to have these these societies happen and to build them it's just so much harder um that it's just you have to constantly pull yourself back from like oh i could do another you know media appearance or, or write another post about how this might be you know or i can um you know do the hard work to try to establish one of these zones. Um, and yeah, it's not, it's not really like one lesson. There's a lot of lessons. Like for example, with Honduras, uh, they changed their constitution to create the world's first program for enabling charter cities, which is amazing. Um, and I was like, wow, to me, the, it, the, the hard thing is the political will. And you know, once you change your constitution, awesome. So we raised money, started a company, started working to design a city and find tenants. Um, and then, you know, 
it seemed like they were dragging their feet and then their Supreme Court struck it down and they passed it in revised form and we kind of saw like, wait a second, it turned out that they didn't have any budget or, or staff. You know, the people working on it from the government working on it because they believed in the program and that it could help their people. Um, they were not even close to ready to actually do the program. Um, and now, you know, it's seven years later, six or seven years after we started working with them and they still haven't, they still haven't launched a Z, although I know that they've been working on it very hard over those years. They've, they've created the program, you know, they have an application process. Um, they've, they've, they found land areas. They've kind of done the majority of what, what is needed to launch the program. And I, I'm still super excited about it, but you know, the reality of changing the constitution versus creating the program where it was, it was so different than I thought. Um, and you kind of, it, it, from a funding perspective, like you gotta be really careful not to get ahead of the host country. Um, you know, and I think they've had some of this problem with Blue Frontiers too, is it's very easy to, you know, get a non-binding MOU, for example, or get, get interest and, and kind of want to go, want to go hard, want to like invest a lot um, and, and put a big team towards trying to make it happen. But governments move slowly. And I, I think it's really amazing that governments are starting to be open to doing this kind of thing. Like that's exciting, but it doesn't mean that it's going to happen, you know, in a month or even in a year. Uh, this is something that takes, that takes years uh, in the best case, takes, takes a year's long relationship, uh, not decades, but years. And so you, you have to make sure that your team is, is, fun, is small enough and cheap enough and funded well enough to be able to go through those years. And it, it's a really tricky chicken and egg problem because to get the deal, like it really helps if you have high net worth investors, if you have anchor tenants, if you have a list of people who want to live there, um, but it takes resources to get those things. And so it's a really tricky balancing act where you're trying to build up the legitimacy of the project, but without spending too much money. Um, and, you know, that's where I think a definite point, like getting that binding agreement and not just the non-binding one, when you can say like, all right, you know, we're going to go all out now, like a binding agreement, it can still be, you know, you, you'll, you can get one of those, but still be negotiating some of the details. So like, sure, it could still fall through or, or be pulled back. Um, but that's the point I think where it's worth, you know, really like raising more money and, and, and growing your team. On the, on the point of money, obviously that's the main factor that you can link from the thought leadership phase into the doing phase. Um, and it's, it's, it's very well known that your big impetus was, was Peter Thiel. How did you build a relationship with, with Peter and how were you, what type of lessons could you tell aspiring entrepreneurs to do something similar? I mean, I, I really, I mean, I don't know if what I did was repeatable. What I did was, was just, um, I mean, it's kind of like the modern, like naked brand kind of approach. It was just, I thought a lot and I wrote a lot and I built an audience for my ideas. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't contact Peter and I didn't have a relationship with him beforehand. It was, you know, the community of people who were following me, um, who, you know, happened to, to be close to him and who put us in touch. So it wasn't anything I did uh, explicitly. Um, and I, you know, although I will say there was, um, there was one other, one other high net worth person who had actually kind of reached out to me before that. And we didn't end up working together for various reasons, but you know, to me that's kind of evidence that, you know, it wasn't just a fluke that, that Peter discovered me that, you know, I, I, I wrote this book, I put it online, I wrote about it. And I actually, you know, had two different people kind of, um, you know, tenderly offer to, to sponsor me. Um, but it also, yeah, it's, it's very chancy. I wouldn't want to count on that working. You know, I, I think I'd recommend that people build the reputation for sure first, but then, you know, you probably want to be more active about, uh, about finding and getting in touch with the people who can fund it. Um, I think, I think there's a lot of other differences too, between the, like starting the, you know, a charter city business and the thought leadership, you know, the skills required are really different. Uh, one thing I'm really coming to believe is, is how much these projects are real estate businesses. Like how at the beginning I was like, Oh, if you make a good government with good rules, then like, 
um, say libertarians from all over the world will move there. And it turns out it's really hard to get people to move. So you really need to be able to, yeah. <laughs> or, you know, it's really hard to get anyone who's not, you know, trying to flee their country to move. And so you need to appeal to a stream of people who's already living in the area, who's already moving and retiring there. And it needs to be a good real estate project separate from the governance layer. The governance layer should be something that adds on to your real estate project and not something that you think is going to completely drive it. And so that like real estate development experience, you know, which from an academic standpoint maybe is, is, is boring or is at least certainly different, I think is, is absolutely critical to these projects. So one experience that you had early on with real estate was that you were running a co-living space. How did that impact your work with the Seasteading Institute or the idea of startup societies more broadly? You know, I think, I think it's mattered less than I expected in the sense that um, I'm, I'm coming to, you know, there's kind of a, we've always had this debate from the beginning of Seasteading of what we call the high road versus the low road. And so on the one hand, these, you know, we have this primal urge to build our own stuff build our own infrastructure, to live together with a tribe and form a community because, you know, that's how it was for most of human history. Um, and the, the, what we call the low road DC setters, the DIYers, the ones who get really excited about, like, I can make my own solar technology. I can, like, heat my own water. And, like, I mean, I understand the appeal of all of that. Um, you know, it all seems super fun to me, too. I love going to Burning Man and, like, setting up my own infrastructure and, you know, working my ass off. Um, to do that. That's extremely fun. Um, but I am skeptical that that's the route to starting new countries. I think that, uh, that the ocean is expensive. I think that we live in a global economy of specialization and trade. And that like, ultimately, you know, if you're going to build a new city state, um, you need to do it by specializing, by innovating like as little as possible by not doing everything yourself, by not inventing and using every new technology. And so I'm, you know, fundamentally just don't believe in the low road. I see its appeal. I think it's a great vacation. I, I, don't, I don't think that it's gonna work. And so as a, as a high roader, the type of communities that I see are larger and kind of less, a bit less tribe-like and maybe, you know, more motivated uh, by economics, for example, like doing a charter city in, a, in the developing world and having people move there, you know, because they want jobs. Um, and I think there's still going to be some communal aspect, like you may be seeding your city with some number of entrepreneurs, even if you can't find, you're, you're not going to get a full population of, say, uh, morally aligned entrepreneurs moving from all over the world to fill your city. But you might be able to get, you know, 20 or or a hundred of them meaningfully amount to start companies and and create jobs in your city and that will be to some degree a community but you know i don't think that a charter city you know i think it's going to be more like a real estate development with some aspect of community among the initial movers uh, and less like an intentional community but i i could be wrong and there's definitely with the explosion of like co-living and co-working companies around the world uh, I can totally see you know integrating a community like that into one or more charter cities you know I'm really excited about uh, in the next 10 years hopefully starting a bunch of these um, and being able to have a network of those spaces well, I, I totally agree on your point um, in fact when you look at early American colonies we found that these Puritan type communities that were heavy involved in the religious aspect um, not really interested in the economics, they tended to fail fairly quickly, but the ones that were more economically based, they tended to thrive. Um, but uh, Makes sense. one thing that I wanted to ask is, well, obviously we need to have an economic incentive, not rely purely on the community in order to create these projects. You have been instrumental in creating a community of people attracted to seasteading. What have your, your observations been from when there's this fledgling, just an audience of a blog into something larger? Yeah. Um, you know, I think, I think having festivals like ephemera was important. Having, having meetups and conferences, traveling around and, and meeting people. Um, you know, I've been working on a, on a 
project lately to try to put together a network of people, um, you know, interested in startup societies and maybe help catalyze some of these actually being built because I think the time is right now. And it's, it's really been amazing how, um, you know, so, so my personal timeline, um, after working for about four years on seasteading and, uh, and Honduras, um, you know, after, after the Honduras company failed, um, I ended up, you know, for, for personal reasons, um, I uh, ended up getting divorced and my children came and lived with me. Uh, they were young, needed, needed a lot of care. So I ended up doing a lot less for some number of years, going back to Google. Um, and, you know, now that I'm becoming more active in this space and starting to travel and meet people more, it's really amazing how, you know, just, just three years of traveling around the world and meeting people, um, you know, and then maintaining those relationships online. There is this whole community out there now of people who are still around, who are still interested, who are happy to talk and happy to meet, who have friends who, that, who they've, they've told about it and, and gotten interested. And so, you know, I think, you know, one blog is just one blog, but if you're able to, to travel and meet people and do conferences and, and, and be in the media and have people doing local meetups, uh, and kind of all of these things. And, you know, the other thing that matters, I think, is that people are hungry for this idea. You know, it's not just what, what anything that I did or that, that my, my coworkers at CSET Institute did. I think it's also just, you know, we hit a nerve. As, as you know, Peter Thiel said in, in a recent interview how um, he went to give a talk and they said, you know, you can talk and answer questions about anything except seasteading because um, once people start talking about seasteading, they can't talk about anything else. Uh, and we, we want you to talk about a bunch of things. Um, and so I think it just really struck a nerve that people are, you know, are hungry for a frontier. They're hungry for new societies. They see that things aren't working. Um, you know, they believe that we need startup countries uh, like startup companies. And so there's that, that audience, you know, people hear the idea, they get hooked, they want to join your mailing list, they want to come to your meetups, because it's so exciting. It's, it's giving them hope um, in a, a sector of the world where there's not a lot of hope. And where, in my opinion, what hope there is, is kind of all a mirage, you know, and some number of people get excited about the red hats versus the blue hats. And like, oh, maybe if I pick the right side and vote for the right person and, you know, yell loud enough, something will happen. But there's a, a pretty solid minority of people who see that, you know, that's, that's just a, a big kind of fake contest. Like, no matter who you vote for, a politician gets elected um, and, and are, are hungry for, for hearing about an alternative. I mean, it, it must feel surreal on a personal level to, to see something grow out, out of completely nothing. So I can't imagine what that's like. Um, it, it's crazy. I'm not, I'm not very good at, at looking at it. I always tend to, you know, I've, I've the, a personality that always focuses on what, what's not yet done. And so for, you know, for me, it's like, well, there is not, there's not a, a startup city state Hong Kong. There aren't like dozens of charter cities all over the world. I mean, there isn't even one, like how could I possibly feel that I've done anything? Um, but I don't, I think that it's a long road and, and taking pride along the way is a, is a better way to be. My wife reminds me of this and I'm, and I'm trying to learn. So I have had a few of these moments, like looking around ephemeral, you know, and seeing 500 people and like these different neon lights, like lighting up the Delta and music from these different platforms and being like, wow, I, I helped make this happen. That's, that's cool. So I try. Well, it's good that you have a realistic view of it. Uh, I have a feeling you won't be happy until you see uh, Mr. Lee's Greater Hong Kong. Uh, <laughs> that's right. It, it, until you can just start a city and then choose from a bunch of um, franchise-owned quasi-national entities or who's going to govern it. Uh, I, I, think, I think if there's one, I think I'll at least be like a little bit happy. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're an easy man to please. <laughs> um, so after the Seasteading Institute, you you obviously took a little bit of a break from being as intensive in the Seasteading Institute. It's really important as a founder to have experience in in the startup space, and also for you, venture capital 
Can you tell me a little bit about your experience in other startups and venture capital and how that could potentially help um, yourself and others in startup cities movement? Sure. Um, you know, I think that, that while there's an aspect of real estate development to a, a startup society, there's also a startup aspect. You're trying to make something from nothing. And I think kind of all the lessons of, of startups and skills apply. You know, it, it may not be tech, but everything else, you know, that you need product market fit. You have to understand how you're different from competitors. Why will people live in, in my city and not in other cities nearby? Um, and just the, the courage that it takes to take an idea and try to change the world to fit it. Um, you know, assembling a team, raising money. Um, you know, I think that, that fundamentally a startup society is, is, is a startup. And there's some cases where it's not, right? Like there are cities being built all the time in the world, uh, large projects sponsored by governments, for example. And if you get involved with one of those projects and help, you know, add a, a special governance zone aspect to it, it's, it's maybe not as much of a, of a startup, you know, if you're working on a $5 million city. Um, but most of these projects, I think, are startups. Uh, on the venture capital side, yeah, I've, I've run a, a small venture fund for the last seven years, investing in a variety of, of tech companies. Um, and I would say that, that one of the things that's really important is the network of entrepreneurs, that definitely a lot of people who are interested in startup societies are successful tech entrepreneurs. Um, and I think it's really, it's really important that we get experienced entrepreneurs who have networks of, of capital um, and a track record of success into this space. It's, it's, it's really great when, you know, if those people end up starting societies, which we certainly are, are hearing them say that they want to do. Um, you know, again, it, it hasn't happened yet, but I think, I think it's only going to take one, you know, big success to inspire a bunch of countries to start, to start copying because the idea is just, just so good. Um, so I would say that evaluating startup societies, evaluating teams comes a bit from, from that venture capital experience. Uh, but mostly it's, it's the network of, of people. You know, there's something about tech, even though it's, it's in some ways so different from starting a new country that, you know, where people understand that, you, you know, you, you compete, you don't complain, you know, you argue by building like exit works. Um, all of these things that are, are core to, the, to what it takes to see startup societies as like a viable option rather than just going and like, make sure that you vote and that will change things. Um, yeah. And as you said, you know, the startup element is, is absolutely crucial, but you've also worked at one of the largest companies in the world. And uh, so tell me about your experience there and how that might impact the way you approach startup city projects. Yeah, so I joined Google in, um, in 2004 um, and have wor worked there for uh, about four years and then came back and have worked there for about uh, four more. Um, and yeah, it's been really amazing to see, to see how it grew. Uh, I think that, that Google fought hard against like becoming a big company and all of the kind of badness and bureaucracy that comes with that, um, you know, but ultimately companies are affected by their size, you know, and there's only so much you can do. Um, Google had a really unique culture. It's kind of, you know, we talked earlier about the thinking versus the doing, and there's something where at Google, they really unified both of them. They're like, we're gonna hire academic type, really smart people and give them a playful environment and try to make life as much like university as we can, but we're actually building stuff that makes money. And there's, you know, I don't know if it applies to the startup city space. There's something about Google where, you know, they have a business structure where if you just write a better algorithm, you know, they, they can make money. Like, you know, the quality of our logistic regression, you know, it directly affects our, our revenue. And so there's a way for, for smart academically minded people to just, you know, crank on these kind of almost pure math problems um, and have that help the company. And, you know, I think it's tempting to see startup societies as that way. Like, you know, if you think of the perfect legal system, everything will work out. But I think, I think they really aren't. I think it's really, 
a startup society is much more of a, of a practical real estate business. Something else that I've kind of changed my mind on, I got into this space wanting to make brand new legal and political systems, and I still think that's great for the long term. But in terms of near term uh, cities that we can start, I think you don't need anything new. I think if you just take the best laws from around the world, put them together uh, in courts w with honest judges, that that's better than 90% of the world and that that's enough to, to make your city succeed. And I think we should be doing that um, and now. And then, you know, in the next generation, maybe starting to experiment with more unique legal and political institutions. So beyond the purely political aspects of startup societies, uh, you mentioned this real desire to make transhumanism and incredibly intelligent AI as part of your mission. Why is, is um, and, and it would be caused by startup societies, obviously. Um, why is transhumanism such an integral mission to you? I mean, transhumanism is upgrading humans with technology. And I think that, you know, if we don't upgrade humans with technology, then, um, you know, we'll, we'll get left behind. Uh, I think, like, now is an age when, you know, we can. We're starting to be able to transform ourselves. And, and we should. Um, you know, I do think that there's risks. I, I share people's concerns about the risks of AI, for example. Um, but, you know, we don't have an option to just uh, not march ahead with technology. You know, we only have the option to try to try to do it well. So, you know, it's not my, my personal focus in terms of what tech stack I understand is not transhumanism. You know, I'm more interested in our systems for coordination and living together. But upgrading the, you know, individual humans is also really important. So I mentioned it's obvious that transhumanism and AI would be helpful with startup societies. Maybe for some of our users, it isn't exactly. So can you explain how startup societies could help with the acceleration of transhumanism? Yeah, one of the major barriers to, um, to a lot of medical technology is bad regulation, um, you know, both in preventing people from doing, from researching new technologies, preventing people from um, then like approving or launching or delivering those technologies. You know, uh, Peter Thiel said that what he's most excited about um, for startup societies is that medical aspect because he funds a lot of biotech companies and is very interested in extending human lifespan and uh, just, just sees those regulations as a huge problem. Um, so, yeah, I think that having, having better medical laws um, and having people be able to, to consent to trying unusual treatments if they're fully informed about the risks you know, regardless of what some bureaucracy says, uh, is going to be, you know, I think that startup societies will help drive medical research of all kinds. I mean, not just transhumanism, but, you know, ending cancer and figuring out how to use stem cells to regrow our organs and, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. For, for example, my wife's really interested in ectogenesis, you know, the idea of having an artificial womb, um, you know, and from there's sort of this political aspect of like, well, it's the last big physical difference between men and women. Um, you know, what if, what if uh, we erase that with technology? Um, and the limitation in the U.S., so you can think of, think of it as moving at two ends. There's like trying to save babies that are born early, and that is completely legal. And so we're able to save babies as early as, I think, 22 weeks. Um, but then at the other end, it's, there's a legal limitation that you're only allowed to try to keep a fetus alive for 14 days. Um, and after that, you're not allowed to. And so, you know, the, the window has been narrowed from like, you know, zero to nine months is where it starts. And now it's like 14 days to 22 weeks. That's where we can't do it with technology. But at the 14 days, it's because we're not allowed to. Like, and, and I don't see any reason that, um, you know, like, at, fertilized egg that's being discarded uh, from an IVF process that somebody doesn't want. Um, I don't see any reasons why we couldn't try to keep it alive for like 21 days or 28 days in order to be able to develop this technology. Interesting. Probably too controversial, but. pro evictionism is an interesting stance, that's for sure. Um, uh, I think that's what uh, Walter Block called it, pro evictionism. Yeah. Um, which you mentioned your wife and you share this 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 uh, passion for 
transhumanism. There was even a New York Times article, I believe, or, or something that said a love to last um, multiple lifetimes. W what attracted you to Brit? How did you originally meet her? Um, well, we actually met because she came and worked for the Seastead Institute. Um, and um, yeah, yeah. And, and she just had this, you know, first off, she was interested in these ideas. And she just had this, uh, I don't know, kind of incredible, like, grace about her and was, was mature beyond her years. Um, and, yeah, and then we, after I left, uh, James Hogan and I, who, who we ran the CSUN Institute together, uh, we left to try to build this, this city in Honduras because we, you know, we, we were into seasteading from this idea of starting new societies and, you know, the ocean looked like the place to do them. But hey, if a country was going to let us do it on land, then great. And so we both left the seasteading Institute together to do that. Um, and a bit after that, uh, once I was not um, her employer, uh, Britt and I started dating and uh, yeah, kind of. Never looked back. Um, and yeah, that New York Times article, we actually did discuss when, when we we're getting married, like, okay, what if lifespans are extended? Like, how long are we getting married for? And, and we, you know, settled on some answer that was, that's more than a lifetime, but less than infinity. Like, there, there's, there's, some, there's some infinite lifespan at which we should, like, stop and discuss, uh, you know, and, and renegotiate. But that it's... Um, it's more than one current human lifetime. Well, I mean, if, if you have that impression with your wife, I'm sure that's even more so with your children. And, you know, from what I've seen and what we discussed, ch your children are very important to you. What are some values that you make sure to instill in your children? It's really tricky because, you know, I have these, this strong drive towards freedom but also I see the importance of structure and rules and you know there's this weird it's kind of like um it if you're like if you're into competitive governance there, there's one perspective of like the libertarian who doesn't want any rules and then there's another perspective of like hey I love rules so much that I want to be able to like play with them as my art I want to be able to like try out different systems and have more of them um, and I, I have like both of those within me, like the desire to just like escape and then the desire to like just find like good rules and good structure. And I, I find that a lot with my kids. So it's this kind of balancing act between wanting to like to respect their individuality and wanting to like give them structure and rules because, you know, a kid can't necessarily come up with, with good ones. So I would say the values include um, curiosity and obedience at the same time. like follow the rules, but understand why they exist. And, you know, when there's time to talk about them, we'll talk about them, but it's often not at the moment the rule is being enforced. Um, you know, like respect for old ways of doing things. We try to teach them, um, I don't know what people probably would call old fashioned manners. Cause I think that the manners of a hundred years ago are better than the manners of today. Um, but you know, there are some new values like, you know, you want, I think it's good to teach your kids to write thank you cards, um, but to be in favor of gay marriage, maybe is how I would put it. Um. So having children is, is a lot like trying to determine your legacy. In, in 50 years time, or, or hundreds or thousands of years is more of your timeline, but um, what would you want your legacy to be? I, I definitely see children as being about legacy. It's kind of like the, there's like the two pronged uh, approach. It's like try to spread ideas and change the world and have kids and teach them. Um, and I think those are both really important prongs of the approach. And I would hope to succeed at both. Um, I want to, you know, there's something my wife and I talk about is, and that, you know, I've experienced myself as sort of a, a, a third generation of a successful family. Um, it's really hard for successful people to have successful grandchildren. Like there are just these, you know, there's that, that line about like good, uh, strong people make easy times and easy times make bad people and bad people make bad times. And, and, um, you know, or the way that my, my father and grandfather said it was the it was shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in, in three generations. 
Um, and so, yeah, I, I would really like it if, you know, my great grandchildren were hardworking, successful people with good values. Like, I think that's hard, um, really hard to, you know, it's one thing to, to pass on values, but to pass on values in such a way that your children will pass on those values and, and, and their children will pass on those values is, is really hard. I think that's something that people should be thinking and talking a lot more about as parents. Um, you know, there's so much parental writing about like how to be a parent, but not about these like multi-generational effects. It's something I'm really interested in. Um, you know, and, and then on the ideas side, I want to see a world where there's uh, multiple floating Hong Kongs in the ocean, um, you know, where we don't just experiment with governance like on the blockchain, but we actually bring those ideas into physical reality where there's a constant stream of new societies being started, where a minority of the population lives in them because like most people should not be using the new products of startups, but you have to have some people doing that so that we can learn new ways that work better. And I just, I want to see governance advancing like other technologies and using other technologies where the way that we govern our societies changes in the same way that the way that we communicate changes, the way that we drive changes, you know, we're about to switch to, to self-driving cars. Um, people are working on, on going to space, um, you know, but governance, we're still using 250 year old governance technology. And I just want that to change. So we have only a couple of minutes left, but I wanted to ask, obviously your case and any other individual's case is not record is like not repeatable. It all has this historical context, but for startup society entrepreneurs that want to make this impact, what can they do? What should they be doing in order to make this change, not just for their startup, but for the next startup that's going to replace theirs? Yeah, I think um, that's a great question. I think, I think that there's like a really, there's a pretty clear set of skills, things like community building, entrepreneurship, uh, real estate experience, um, that, that are needed that like building your own, building your own competencies and your own abilities, building your network of entrepreneurs and capital, um, you know, that those things are really, are really important and finding ways to contribute to the space as a whole. Um, you know, there's this, anybody who's worked at a nonprofit knows like how hard it is to find, I mean, it's even hard to hire good people for money. But how hard it is to find, to like get volunteers who will do anything useful, um, and like such people are just very very rare because it's it's hard to do good work. It's hard to do good work remotely. It's hard to do good work remotely for free. Um, but there is plenty of work to be done. So I would encourage people to like find uh, you know a sustainable way that fits in their life to contribute to one of these organizations. Um, you know, using their skills to like, or, or start your own project, you know, just something that, that you do uh, competently and effectively to kind of add to the body of work in the movement is something we really need. All right, Patrick, I, I want to thank you so much for your time and for all you've done for this movement. Obviously, uh, it had a huge impact on the Startup Studies Foundation. I don't think there's a, there's a significant possibility that it wouldn't even be an organization if it wasn't for, for your work with the Seasteading Institute. So I wanted to thank you for all of that. You're welcome. And thanks for, uh, thanks for doing the work because I'm sure there wouldn't be a, wouldn't be a startup society's foundation without, uh, without what you do. Thank you, Patrick. Um, and, uh, I'll talk to you soon. Everyone. Thank you again for joining the startup society's foundation podcast. Hope you enjoyed it.